Hi, good afternoon viewers and welcome to Matters of Public Importance on Channel 6. I'm yours, Gail Teixeira, Chief Whip for the Parliamentary Opposition, representing the People's Progressive Party, Civic and the People's Progressive Party. On this program, we shall focus on matters of public importance, bringing you information and discussions on matters and issues that are important to you, the Guyanese people, right here every Thursday between 12.30 and 1.30 on Channel 6. And as usual, I remind you of the numbers you can use to call in, 2250010 and 2250008. And remember, too, as usual, if your number is blocked and I can't see your numbers of your telephone numbers, then I can't take the call. My apologies. As usual, I inform you that the office of the Lady Opposition at 304 Church Street between New Garden and Peter Rose Streets, just right opposite the Board Cricket Ground, is open Monday to Saturday, and we're available to meet with you. You have issues you want to raise, concerns, you want representation, you need advice, we're there to serve you, the Guyanese public. And so our telephone number, 225-3432, uh, if you wish to call to seek advice or you wish to speak to someone or you wish to make an appointment. And of course, you know, Freedom Radio is still on the, on the waves and can be found on FM 91.1, Demerara 90.5, Burbese and 90.7, Esquibo. And I said to you last week that Mirror newspaper, the weekly newspaper, is now going online free of charge. So you're free to uh, subscribe and be able to receive it on a weekly basis um, by Saturday. Well, we started a new month. Um, and the, as I said last week, the February is the month of Mashramani and the 48th Republic anniversary. And you may have noticed, I don't know if you have, but I certainly wasn't properly informed, obviously, when I noticed that the mash route has changed once again. And so an announcement yesterday in the papers to do with vending spots um, for mash day caught my eye. And so according to that report in the newspapers, that the parade, the mash, mash money parade, will begin at Thomas and Albert Street. You know where that is, right? Um, then proceed east towards Basingen Road and turn south into Basingen Road, continue along Basingen Road until meeting Durban Park, where they will enter the southwestern end, that's Hatfield and West Basingen Road. Uh, the strange thing in the announcement also said that there will be no vending or picketing for families on Basingen Road from Thomas Lands until Hatfield Street. This is a, uh, what I'm reading from is the Department of Public Information um, press release that has come out. Um, and of course they had in the Georgetown municipality has put out the cost for the boots and where they will be located. So if you're driving on the Irving Street side, uh, um, between Church and Lamaha, you will see a number of markings that are quite small with numbers. I believe that is where they may be allowing uh, vending to go on. But there's confusion in the report because they're also saying you can't vendor and you can't picnic in certain areas. So that uh, government again, uh, total confusion. They don't like to leave anything that worked alone. So their view is that if it worked under the PVP, throw it out, destroy it, and start again. So here we go. <coughs> they throw out MASH <coughs> traditional route <coughs> and relocated it to Brick Dam going up to uh, Nash, uh, the, the um, what do you call Durban Dur Jubilee Park, Durban Jubilee Park, and did that for two, two years, and now they're now switching and starting at Thomas and Albert Street. Not a very easy spot for floats from my own experience as being in charge of MASH for quite a long time. These are narrow roads and these are big floats with large contingents. So good luck. As usual, the government believes they have to be the inventors of something different from the People's Progressive Party. So you're starting, in other words, at Thomas and Albert. If, so if you want to see the floats commence, that's where you go. Very small area for you to be able to get a chance on the road. And then coming up to Bliss Injun and Thomas, where the big lights are. And then going into Bliss Injun all the way down to the uh, Durban Park. So that's the route for the MASH parade on February 23rd. So that's to do with MASH, and as usual, the government stubbornly refuses to listen to the people and what the people want. Last week, we examined the difference between the People's Progressive Party Civic and the APNU AFC coalition government's approach to bipartisanship, with the setting up of new commissions of inquiry and a number of other issues. 
Well, the COI on Lino Creek was supposed to start public hearings today, and an hour after it should have started, the Commissioner retired Justice Trotman announced that it had been postponed due to some difficulties. So that's the latest on the COI on Linden. And then we have judicial appointments, the swearing in of two judges uh, in the last two weeks, uh, Mr. Arik Bulkan and Mr. Rafi Khan yesterday have been appointed as temporary judges, approximately six months each. Um, now, you may not know the Judicial Service Commission by the Constitution is the body that recommends to the President who to appoint, and the President really has no uh, discretionary powers to, to not appoint. And so, um, but the Judicial Service Commission expired on September the 10th, 2017. And so one wonders how are these appointments being made when the Judicial Service Commission is not in existence and has not been since September. So, but I understood that Mr. Khan said he was interviewed prior to um, the expiration of the Judicial Service Commission. However, that still doesn't mean the Judicial Service Commission formally wrote the President recommending both Mr. Bulkan and Mr. Khan as temporary judges um, in accordance with the Constitution. And when one checks Article uh, 1282, which the, Mr. Granger quoted when he was swearing in Mr. Um, Mr. Khan yesterday, um, 128.2 also says that the president appoints based on the advice of the Judicial Service Commission. So there we go again, more twigging and bending and tweaking and undermining of the Constitution of Ghana. Almost every week we're having cases of that. Well, this week we're going to focus on agriculture and the agricultural sector in particular sugar industry and the rice industry. And we continue to view, to remind our viewers that 5,000 odd sugar workers um, have been terminated. And so there's a statement that came out from Gawu, on uh, the workers held their press conference uh, at Gawu headquarters yesterday. And the statement is called, Times Get Tougher in the Sugar Belt. And I'll read excerpts from this statement, which they released yesterday and had a press conference. <coughs> We, the workers present here today, represent the overwhelming majority, if not all, of the workers and thousands of Guyanese who've been affected by the ill-considered plans to reduce the sugar industry through the closure of estates in the past two years. At this time, the real situation shows the misery of the affected is worsening by the day. Workers simply do not know what to do. We spend our days moving from street to street, village to village, and business to village, business to business seeking jobs. Some of us have looked far and wide but simply cannot find one or one with pay that we can survive on. Even some workers who have secondary and technical education have found securing a job difficult. And in those perchance instances where workers do manage to find a job, they confront the stark reality that it is temporary and their wages are far below what they earned in the sugar industry. With payable jobs, we could walk with our heads held high, but today the pride we felt has all but gone. Nowadays, too, housewives have a hard time and a difficult task to make do with what is available and what is there is really not much. Today, the children of all ages are becoming aware that their education may be cut short as they may have to leave school and accept the sad prospect that their dreams for life have to be forgotten. This is a sad reality that faced the people of the Sugar Belt. The statement continues. While some workers are receiving their full severance payments and others have half, those sums can by no means support a family for more than a few months. In some families, husband and wife worked at the estate, and for them the blow has been doubly harsh. At this time, workers simply do not know what would happen next. For many younger workers who have now begun adult life and have secured mortgages to build a home, some having young children, the situation is even more dire. For them, they would have just a few years of service, and thus their severance entitlements would be nominal. They are now faced with the sleepless nights as they wonder how to meet those obligations or whether their properties would be taken from them and they and their families left homeless. For older workers, they wonder who would hire them when they are not too far away from pensionable age. 
those who have got, given their best years to the sugar industry and work hard to reach many of their life goals now confront the sad reality they have to start over their working life. Their dreams to reach age 60 in the sugar industry and to enjoy the fruits of their years of labor have been pulled like a rug from under their feet. We are hard-working people who have been reduced to hapless victims. It is disturbing that the government which sent large delegations a few days ago to meet with workers came empty-handed. The visitors, it seemed, came just to make speeches filled with sweet words and to take photographs. Not one of them took the time to walk the village and see the evident deterioration which has stepped in the communities. To look us in our eyes and to explain to us why they took such terrible decisions. And to visit our homes, to see firsthand the paucity of rations, and to see the hardships we and our families face. The visitors left more quickly than when they arrived in their fancy air-conditioned vehicles to go back to their homes far away from the suffering they created. As they say, out of sight, out of mind. It is indeed disturbing that some of these people came to us not long ago <coughs> and told us they would make our lives better, that they would give us 20% pay increases, and that they would rescue the sugar industry and that they would protect our jobs. Today, these people tell us God wanted the industry to close and they have made hard decisions. We wonder that whether these people have a heart and a conscience. We know that the government has said it wants to work with our union to take us out of the troubles we face. We know that the Gao and Nasi have told the government to reopen the estates and put us back to work. This is what we want and we support our union, but we want to tell the government time is of essence. We know too that the government said that it wants to sell the estates. As workers, we do not think this is the best decision, as many of our hard-won benefits very likely will be taken away. Our union, we know, has told the government that should the estates be sold, then our rights must be respected and certain benefits upheld. It concludes, the statement concludes, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, the media general conditions for us are growing tougher. Our little, our little monies we have are reducing steadily and surely and our severance pay cannot last very long. We want to work, to produce, and to earn. Our union is standing by our side in this difficult time, and we're very thankful for their support. We are at the same time are supportive of our union's efforts as they try in every possible way to make our lives whole again. Let us continue to stand together as we wage our struggle for a better tomorrow. It's a very emotional, very touching statement and very realistic statement by the sugar workers. We also have a commentary which I wanted to bring to your attention in case you haven't seen it. And this is the sta a letter to the editor, also in today's paper, by someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Um, and this is Ian McDonald, who has worked in sugar, uh, been a, a high levels in the Sugar and the Ch Sugar Producers Association in the region. And he wrote a letter today saying, what is happening in the sugar industry as it falls into disrepair? And this is printed in the Starbuck News. <coughs> and he says this, when the Trinidad sugar industry was in its death throes and the closure was imminent, I remember a good friend of mine who was in a senior management position at Crony to the end telling me the, about the chaos which overtook that industry as controls slackened and were lost. I cannot bear to think that our sugar industry is near such a state. But when whole estates are being abandoned, factories shuttered, production slipping to levels not seen for 150 years, morale declining and a future speculative to say the least, it may be time to ask what is happening in the industry as it falls further and further into disrepair and despair. And he asked a series of questions, and I can't read all of them for you on the program, but I read a few of them. <coughs> what is happening to drainage integration infrastructure and pumping stations and equipment and routine procedures and maintenance and planning? Are the conservancies and their daily maintenance being attended to efficiently? What is being done with thousands of acres of dams and cultivated fields so carefully brought into production over the dec decades and now being abandoned? What is happening to the myriad roads and bridges and field structures now neglected? What is being done with field equipment now unused? What is happening in the closed factories? 
what is being done with field and factory workshops and their extensive inventories, what is happening to the closed offices and office furniture and equipment and supplies, what is being done with the stores with their millions in value in spares and replacements and fertilizers and weedicides and items of a thousand kind. Of a thousand kind. <coughs> What is happening to all the houses and buildings on the abandoned estates and their furniture and content? What is being done with all the innumerable cars and trucks and motorbikes, motorbikes and vehicles of every sort now redundant? What is happening to the health centers and community centers and staff clubs and guest houses and all that these contain and provide? What is happening at the Demerara sugar terminals where our bulk sugar was shipped so efficiently for so long? I'm taking it for granted that the regionally acclaimed world-class Port Marant Apprentice Training Center will continue to be well-staffed and fully operational and even expanded to meet retraining needs and the national hunger for more and more technical skills. It is essential that this part of the industry is strengthened, not diluted or di diminished. And he goes on and on about artifacts, records, and so on. Where, for instance, is the molasses to come from now to feed our important and rapidly expanding liquor exporting business? And what happened to our once so highly regarded cane variety testing program? We were the leaders in that field. It is not a simple thing unraveling before our appalled eyes. It needs hard work and vigilance and devoted application to prevent even greater loss to the nation. Who is taking hold of this? Which minister knows what is happening and bears responsibility? I know that the nation's chief concern must be for six to 7,000 displaced sugar workers and their families, and more to come, and how to best to assist them and their stricken communities. However, there are other questions which deserve an answer as this one great industry spirals towards total collapse. It's from Ian MacDonald, a man who is highly respected and knows an awful lot about sugar, awful lot. So here we have it. Here we have it, my friends. And then, if that, so Ian McDonald too has come forward and posed many of the questions that we've been posing the whole of January, December, before that in relation to the closure of these estates, after the uh, handing over of all the assets to Nissel on December 29th, and the uh, dismissal of thousands of workers, we've been asking similar questions. So I'm very pleased on this program that we have not been far distracted or been far away from the points that Mr. McDonald has raised. And then <laughs> we have this uh, announcement from a source which is quoted in the papers today. We have this announcement that I read in the papers today. Scaled and Enmore estates for limited restart to reap cane still in fields, attract investors. This was in the Starbuck News. Now, whether this article or the, the, the source came forward for this article based on the Gao press conference held the day before, and therefore this article is representing an attempt by those who wish to give false hope to workers and keep the temperature down and make sure they don't protest and demonstrate and so on. Or whether it's just a reflection of the total incompetence and ineptitude of the APNO AFC government that they don't know what the devil they're doing. So the article today in the Starbuck News talks about just weeks after they were, sh I'm quoting, just weeks after they were shuttered, the Skeldon and Enmore estates will be reopened by the end of March and some cane cutters re-employed to demonstrate to potential buyers that the estates are viable and as such can be sold as going concerns. Sources say. The article continues to say they're looking at the Skeldon and Enmore estates where it will be reopened so the canes that, they are, that are there now can be utilized and show potential buyers that these are all working estates with assets they will be sold as going concerns, end quote. One source close to the industry told Starbuck News. The source explained there's currently over 300,000 tons of sugar in the fields of the Skeldon Rose Hall and Enmore Estates, and it was government special purpose unit 
which proposed that the estates be reopened to utilize the cane. It is this special purpose unit will now be responsible for overseeing the management of the estates, but it is unclear how the project would be executed. Sources say that not all the workers from the two soon to be reopened estates would be reemployed since only about half of the capacity was needed for the scaled down production. Attempts to um, you remember that that the contract, uh, the special purpose unit, um, contracted Price Waterhouse to do the valuation of all the assets of the estates that were put on the chopping block, and we had pointed out in this program, remember, that how do you put a house up to sale? You lock it up, close it up, abandon it, don't cut the grass, don't keep it clean and tidy. You walk away from it and then you're looking for a buyer and you're looking to get a good price for it. That was the, the comparison we made. And of course, having shut down <coughs> the backlands and everywhere else is being overtaken by weeds and grass. And, and as you know, once you leave a place uh, not being maintained and not being taken care of, it begins to fall apart. And the value of the property lock, uh, drops. The article continues. Remember the Price Waterhouse valuation of the estates will take approximately eight months. So they only started in January, so we're talking about sometime in September 2018. But the article goes on to point out that since November 2017, Kaisuko began moving machines and equipment from estates built to be sold or privatized to others that are functional. A move that saw tensions between them and the government holding company, Nissan, as both sides claimed that they control the assets. Machines were moved from Skellen and Rose Hall to Enmore, with the then chief executive officer of Gaisuko, Errol Hanneman, saying that the machines were relocated to maximum use, since there was no cane where they were and as such of no use for them. It is unclear what Gaisuko had anticipated doing with the now 300,000 plus tons of cane in the field. And so, again, when you read this article, it it really reflects the level, you know, I could say <coughs> a number of things. But this is, after the, the whole way in which they're managing the sugar industry, by the man in the country, is just stupidity. I, we're polite in calling it ineptitude and incompetence, but really it has come down now to brass tacks. Stupidity in running the economy in this country. And so, this article throws more you know, insults at the sugar workers who have been dismissed. This is utter disrespect and disdain for them. The source remains anonymous. So who is this who's speaking that some of these estates may reopen for a short time to cut these canes, which in November they said weren't there and had to move the equipment out of those estates. Now they're saying, oh, we've got 300,000 tons of cane in the fields that need to be cut and that now we're thinking of this. Who is behind this? Is this a smoke screen? Just to kind of tell the sugar workers, don't get upset, don't march, don't protest, and to, to create false hope? Or is it that, in fact, the government just doesn't know what it's doing and therefore now recognize, oh shoot, based on Price Waterhouse and the SPU advice, that you should never have closed it until after the valuation was done, that now they're trying to hustle and have some appearance that they are running the show and that sugar has some operational capacity. <coughs> but then this is an anonymous source. Why isn't the chairman of the Gaisuko board, Mr. Dr. Clive Thomas, who had all the answers when they were in government, all his answers attacked the PPPC for everything they did, and he was the great intellectual economic person who had the answers for Guyana and Gaisuko. And he's been chairing the board from 2015 to 2018 and still is the chairman. Where has he gone into hiding? A whole sugar industry, not the Gaisuko. Sugar is an industry, it's not Gaisuko alone. And the whole thing, as Ian MacDonald refers to, was a set of greatest respect as a very caring man. That the whole thing is collapsing after decades and centuries. And where, are, where is the chairman? He's gone into hiding. Where is the great CEO? He, I already left the country. Where is the now acting CEO? What do they have to say? But where's the Minister of Agriculture in this? Where is the government in this? Where is the president in this? 
The point is everyone's gone into hiding and what they're doing now is surreptitiously putting by sources, I believe, what a misinformation out to the public. I could stand corrected. I, we could stand corrected. I can stand corrected. I may be wrong. Maybe it's true they're going to do this. There are thousands and thousands of tons of sugar already cut and processed in those estates as well as molasses. And every day trucks are taking the sugar and molasses out. Where is it going? Where is the money for this? There are no questions. There's nobody watching them. You know what they say? Nobody's watching the cat with the milk. Nobody's overseeing anything. We don't know. And the government, as usual, plays this cat and mouse game with all of us that the least information you know and we know, the public knows, the better for them. They can more get away with more stuff. And so, my own personal view, which I would be very happy to be proven wrong, is that the government has no intention of opening back the estates. And it believes that this sending uh, mixed signals that this will cause temperatures to go down and this will blow away too. This will blow away again. Remember the teachers have been waiting from 2015 to 2018 for the new multi-year agreement. They threatened to go on strike in October and all of a sudden when they weren't being able to see the Minister of Education, they were having difficulties being able to have discussions with the Minister of Education, suddenly the President summons them to a meeting at the Ministry of the Presidency. A task force is set up. So the union backs off and decides to go the, this route. Then what happens? November, end of November, just before Christmas, the terms of reference of the task force are now announced. One month after it is set up, another month has gone. We're now into the middle almost of, of the, the next month. So they feel that they've tempered down the teachers got them entrapped in this, uh, this arrangement, and therefore teachers have left holding them back. They don't have any increases. They've done the same with the public servants. They promised the public servants in 2015 a 20% increase in salaries. That has not been delivered. But you know, the union is there, and every now and again the union opens its mouth, but they're in a, in a dual loyalty thing because they were very close to APNU AFC. <coughs> and then we have the fact that they will withheld the one month bonus for the discipline services for now three years. Discipline services, if you calculate what each soldier at the lowest level lost in those three years with their 13th month extra salary, you're talking about an only rank at the bottom level and maybe policemen, let's say an average of 60,000, they have lost $180,000. If you were the higher ranks, getting higher up, getting $200,000, you've lost $600,000, for example. The discipline services have been robbed of an agreement in principle, not written, that the discipline services country would get, at the end of each year, the 13th month at whatever was their rank. So it wasn't like in the first year of the APNU government where they gave everybody $50,000 across the board. And then there was nothing in 2016, nothing in 2017. Well, we'll see in 2018 what happens. But we're not only going to deal with sugar today and what the government believes that they can manipulate and damage this economy, manipulate the workers of this country and get away with it. But let's go to the other sector, rice. Remember, rice was their first target when they got into government or when they assumed office. They bungled the Guyana, Venezuela, rice and petro, agreement, petro Caribbean agreements. And we lost the market at, the, at a price that was 30% more than the world price. It's what we were benefiting. So they bungled the whole arrangement because they're pretending to be, you know, what they say, um, they're the, the bunga toughies and the bullies in the ring when the other guy you know, has a, a much bigger boxing hand than you have, or he's much bigger than you have. So, having done that, rice started to go down, and then you have the blow to sugar, and now they're returning back to rice. Having felt that they've now got sugar under control, their estates are closing, thousands of workers have lost their jobs, now they return to what they started with rice. And so again, I quote from my friend 
former Minister of Agriculture and former Minister of Health, Dr. Leslie Ramsamy, in an article he put out in February the 12th. And he says, and I quote from him, that the rice industry, like sugar, has been a victim of the venom of the APNU AFC. As part of his attack on agriculture, APNU has reduced the agriculture budget every year since they got into office by more than $2 billion, $3 billion since 2015, a reduction that affects rice significantly. First is the story of 2,000 acres of rice crops threatened by Gaisuko withholding irrigation water from rice farm farmers. Second is the story of millers being owned more than $2 billion since July 2017. Third is the story of rice farmers from Hope given notices to affect their rice fields. And fourth, rice farmers being threatened by the NDIA of withholding water for irrigation. Now, if you know anything about rice, water is essential to the production of rice in this country. AFC, APNU AFC's relentless attack on agriculture, according to Ms. Dr. Lamsami, is not a mindless assault. It's an assault targeting the stronghold for the People's Progressive Party and Barry Jack Deo. Sugar is a victim of the hatred for Jagan, Jack Deo, and the PPP. Even though Jagan is long gone, his spirit and his inspiration live on in Guyanese of all walks of life, but particularly among sugar workers and farmers. It is this spirit and inspiration that APNU fears the most and that is behind their reprehensible assault on sugar and agriculture as they continue the despicable effort to strangle agriculture, not satisfied with their almost fatal suffocation of sugar. Rice has been a primary target. This past week exposes prime examples of the quiet but vigorous effort to stifle rice. There is a scandal of the GRDB owing rice farm millers more than $2 billion, approximately $10 million US dollars since last July. This is not going back to PP time. The last July for rice exported to Panama. The Panama rice agreement was finalized between Dr. Ram Sami, not Moses Nagamutu, <coughs> and the GRDB back in 2012. It is a government to government deal. Payments are made directly to the GRDB and then remitted to the millers. Non-payment to millers creates a cash flow problem with rice farmers being the main victims. Millers owe hundreds of millions of dollars to poor rice farmers. The problem is further compounded because the first crop harvesting is about to begin. The already beleaguered rice farmers owed hundreds of millions of dollars will face an uphill battle to be paid for their paddy. As if this is not enough stress, the farmers continue to suffer from low payments. The payment of millers and farmers was a prominent issue during the 2015 election campaign. Not only did APNU and AFC leaders promise farmers $9,000 per bag of paddy, they also promised both farmers and millers that they will ensure prompt payments. We have tapes of their public meetings and their, their television programs. And so all of this has showed, exposed them on the campaign trail and afterwards of having lied shamelessly to the Guyanese people. I continue quoting now from Mr. Dr. Ram Chami, Dr. Ram Chami's article. Another vicious attack on rice farmers came in the form of letters issued by APNU AFC to many rice farmers in Hope, demanding that they vacate their land which they occupied for many years. The reason is that the farmers are unable to comply with the more than the 300% increase in lease payments. These rice farmers are not the, not the only ones who face the strong arm tactics of seizing their land, an attack on their constitutional right to own their land. In West Burbies, APNU AFC arbitrarily seized the land of legitimate farmers and the courts and the Chief Justice ruled that the President and the APNU AFC government had acted illegally and unconstitutionally and that their leases should be given back to them up to now that has not been done. Simultaneously, the NDIA, which arbitrarily increased rates for water users, has threatened farmers with withholding irrigation water unless they pay through the Water Users Association the increased rates. Clearly, agriculture is now the, under attack by APNU AFC. Each day, more examples are being seen as sugar and rice struggle to stay alive. 
Clearly, according to Ram Sami, Apnu ASC is orphaning agriculture. With oil on the horizon, Apnu believes that it could target agriculture to strangle the PPP. There's nothing, this is nothing but a stupid political hatchet job, trying to impoverish farmers as a way to put a knife in the heart of the PPP. It will not work. <coughs> oil is good for Guyana, but agriculture is the lifeblood of our country. And so I end the quote from Dr. Ram Sami. Well, we are seeing this unfold and people have to speak out. People have to, as the sugar workers march, as the parking meters people protested peacefully. There was no violence. We have to be able to say no, 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 enough is enough. They cannot tra uh, you know, trample on our rights as a people and destroy our economy. We're a primary producing country, and we have been proud as an agriculture country that of the Caribbean countries, we can feed our people with what we produce. Yes, we import things, but fundamentally, we can live on what we produce, and we produce for our people. Well, you know, there's a lot of things, other things going on, and I'm going to open the floor in one minute. Granger, the President Granger has, uh, to me, done a double speak yesterday, too, when he talked about, he was asked questions about the Exxon Agreement and whether the government was prepared to review it. And he said, well, they won't review the Exxon Agreement. And then he said, well, it's up to Cabinet, and it's Cabinet that will do that. So are they going to review? Are they not going to review? Or is he trying to make sure he's got his fingers on both sides of the, the, the political uh, button so as to say yes you can um, yeah we're not going to review it but you know if you're going to review it it's cabinet is he trying to dissociate himself or he's trying to pass the buck or is it just just his style the fundamental issues they're not going to review the Exxon agreement and by the way have you heard anything about the commission of inquiry on ancestral and Amerindian lands has anyone heard anything are they doing anything have they held public areas? Are they going across the country? Gone into seclusion repairs. So there's another commission inquiry that we haven't heard anything that's going on. And these are fundam fundamental issues that this commission is dealing with on land, on our right to have land, on the Armenian people's right to communal land, on the right of people to communal land, and also the right of people to private land. And so these are fundamental issues that are being eked away by this government. So we're going to now we have a few minutes left, we have about 15 minutes left. Let us move now to the, to the call in, callers, if anybody's calling in. All of these things, I'm looking for the calls coming in and so we will be able to take calls today because the last session I was rather mean and didn't let you call in and give your opinions. <coughs> Someone had said to me the previous, um, uh, that one of the programs, not the last one, the one before, that they were having trouble with the one they were viewing it because there seemed to be a lot of interference and maybe it's just where they were living, maybe there was a problem, but they were having difficulty seeing and hearing the program. And I, if any of you are having that, um, please let me know because um, I can't tell sitting here in the studio. But clearly, agriculture, we are a, we're not a monoculture country, not a monoculture country. Yeah. Good, thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon, Gail. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, go ahead. Hello, go ahead. I'm not hearing you. Sorry about that, I just heard the person, I don't know where they went. If you can call back in again. Um, yeah, they, they, we are not a monoculture in this country. Monoculture means we're not dependent on one product for our economy and to, to bring revenue for our country. We're actually a very fortunate country with rich resources which we have been developing and using over a long time. Hi, good afternoon, welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. We need we the time now to get them power back quick. We need them also. 
immediately I finish. Thank you. Okay, thank you, caller. Um, the sentiments of the gentleman are not unusual. Um, you know, when the government changed, a lot of people uh, would say to me as I walk down the road, is, are we this time? Is are we first time? Uh, get good, the PVP come out of power, we're all bad, etc., etc. And six months later and a year later, people quietly saying, we're disappointed, we were betrayed. And now two years later, going on three years, people want the PVP civic back in government because they know what we did for the people. They know the struggles we went through, but they know that we were a government with a conscience in terms of cushioning the impact of whatever came to our people and being able to give people hope and to be able to plan a future and to be able to look two years up the road. Right now, people can't look up to the end of the month right now. Yes, good afternoon. <laughs> I always have this problem with this phone. I'm not very good at it. I must confess, this is not my forte. Um, and so people want to change. People, people are afraid. People are worried. The, the economy is in serious trouble. Food prices is going up. Cost of living is going up. How can farmers operate if the land on which they are operating, which most of the time is leased land, that is under threat by this government? How can they operate? How can the farmers operate, particularly rice, if they don't have access to water? If the rate they want to increase the rate so high. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good um, afternoon. We like to, we like to come to, you all come to Wales. Yes. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of problems with work. We don't have a job. I know. We've had people go to Wales, but yes, we got to keep people's um, spirit up, you know. I, under, I, I was told recently that um, by some of the private sector people who went for the job fair that Wales Estate is a ghost, ghost, ghost place. Yeah, but they, they, they come, but nobody didn't call back the people them for the, the, the interview or anything. But oh, okay. In a situation right now, nobody gets yeah. the job. Yeah, yeah. The people, people apply to that job fair, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to follow up with the private sector to do with the job fair. What happened to the people who they did, um, who they did interview and stuff like that? What happened in that case? Because they. They did go there to help people. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Yeah, it's it. Wales is in a, in a dread situation and is an indication of what's going to happen at the other estates. If people think that Wales is just an aberration, Wales felt the full brunt of the PNC incompetence and their vindictiveness. Close the estate down, no plan of what to do with it. A year later, the place is still abandoned. There's no nothing going on in there, and many of the workers have not got their severance pay at all, up to now, over a year later. <coughs> Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Well, I'm looking at Visa. I'm going to sit here and get a walk. Yes. All that is going to be doing by Visa and driving car all day and talking about Ireland car. Yeah. I don't understand that. Now, what do you say when we do? Exactly. To go to high school, one is going to UG, he's going to stop. <coughs> I don't know, man. Like, we have to walk and do exactly what the people are doing in America, only the school is going to That's all. Okay. We have to, we have to, this government believes, I think, that the Guyanese people are going to roll over and take it. And so they react to pressure. So when the parking meters was on, the beginning was, they, there was no, nothing. It was fine. It was okay. People came out every Thursday for one hour, for weeks, until they were forced to withdraw it. Now they're coming back with an amended one, and they said they're going to introduce it. I don't know what the parking meters people will do, but is that what we want after all? You've had it with other citizens' initiative, the, edu the VAT on education, where the private schools and other people came out against it. They removed the VAT on the... the um, private schools and, and services for education, but they did not remove the VAT on goods. So all the children continue to pay VAT and the teachers on anything that they buy, supplies, etc., for education. So this government 
has to have pressure. There is a time, and there will be a time in this country, when thousands of people have to march peacefully to get the government to listen. And if they don't listen, when it comes to elections, 2016 and 2018, 20, 2018, sorry, in 2020, the people's voice and choice have to be heard. We have local government elections coming up this year. You have continuous registration going on now. It is up to you, the public, and the citizens who are 17 plus to go to the GCOM registration offices and get your names on the list if you were not put on any list, were never registered. You get your ID card, etc. For those who are on the list that have transferred, gone and moved, then you need to go to those same offices and transfer onto the list where you are presently. If there's any mistake on the list with your name, if it is you don't like the photograph on your ID card, it's too dark, which is a complaint of many people, then rectify it now. You have until the first couple of days of March. I think it's March the 4th. Continuous registration and claims and objection going on at the same time. For those of you who have members of the family or relatives who've died, you can make objections when you come to that period near the end of February, but you have to take in the death certificate. The list, the list, the list. If your name is not on the list, you will not be able to vote. So we can't just talk hot and sweaty. If we're serious about change, and we're serious about change in the PUPC, we are serious in 2020, we're back in government, but we have to make sure that one, uh, the voters are on the list, their, vo their names are correct, etc. they're in the right place where they're supposed to vote, and that we are able to ensure there's no tampering of the election machinery, as in 2015. So we have a lot of work to do. We can't be despondent. I know it is unbelievable, and to tell any sugar worker this time, don't be despondent. It, it's, it, it, it means nothing, because they are confronted daily, as are thousands of other workers who lost their jobs under this government, including the sugar workers. About 10 to 25,000 workers have lost their jobs in the private and public sector because of one, the vindictiveness of the government of firing people left, right, and center when they got in, particularly those of a certain ethnic description. Then you had the private sector with the economy going down, releasing workers. Then, of course, they closed, they sent away a number of investors who employed people here. Barama, Baishin Ling, for example. And the loggers that produce for those companies also are in trouble now. So the government is unraveling all the gains we've made as a country, all. At the democratic level with the constitution, the, the gains we made in the economy, the gains we made in, this, in the quality of life of our people. You know, they have come in with, with such a bad spirit, such a vindictive, vengeful spirit that they're unraveling whatever good we had achieved as a people and that whatever good and hope we had in the future. And that's how serious the situation is. <coughs> Hello, good afternoon. Hello, Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Last call. Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Kito. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'm a concerned parent. Yes. My daughter was born in 1986. She went to school, go to St. Stanislaus College. She goes, she gets a scholarship, she goes study, come back. Right. And she working now is about, she served the government for five years. Uh-huh. They're working. And they're pushing her around now, this new government. Moving her from place to place. And I'm, I don't have a husband. My husband died and my daughter was studying. Yeah. And I don't know what's really going on in this country right now. Yeah, this is part of the vindictiveness. Your government, your daughter works with government, right? It, it was. She worked at the government hospital, but she studied if the other government was ruling. Right. When the PVP was ruling. She grew up in that day. If right. she is allowed to study with them, they were the government that time. Right. Why are they putting out, uh, out of our job because they take over now? Right. What I can, yeah? what I can suggest, if you like, um, if you want us to, to listen more to your story, because you can't on the, I wouldn't advise you on the, on the 
television on this program with your name and I know, stuff like that. But I would like to suggest that you come to the Office of Lady Opposition on Church Street yeah. between New Garden and, and um, Peter Rose. And yeah. we can hear your case and bring your daughter. Okay. And let's see if we can do any representation for her. Okay, okay, okay. But that because story. I'm so worried, I know. Around, pushing all, moving all day, moving all, all about. They're, they're, they're frustrating people, particularly people yes, I suspect. And it's all getting frustrated. We're losing a lot of the wonderful and talent. People, voting for Apple, they voting for people, that kind. Yeah, that's none of the business who you vote for. Right. <laughs> like pressure in the child. Yeah. Like pressure in the child. That story, madam, is there, there are about a thousand stories like that. Um, yeah, I know, I know. It's nice terrible. Know, I know. But we got to be able to see what we can do for each case. And okay. with the young people, we got to try and make sure that they yeah, stay strong. I, I, would, I would wish <coughs> that you yeah, could come along and hear people's problems. Well, we try to get around to different parts of the country. Um, I don't like know where you are. Yeah, we really want to see all this. We are, really you really really are, are you far from Georgetown? Are you far from Georgetown? Yes, I'm calling from Diamond. Ah, okay, all right. And we'll talk to some of our party comers to walk around Diamond and talk. But if you please, like... Please, we're asking you to send people let me okay. know, worry. Okay. okay. And then also make sure that if you can, if you're coming to town any day, See if you can drop in at the lady opposition office and we'll see if what we representation we can do for okay, your daughter. Thank okay. You then. All right, have a good day. All the best yeah, to you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. All right, everybody, we've on the nail and I know that although I started a few minutes, we have to stop on time. So I don't get back my five minutes I'm late. That's okay. I'm not complaining. But you know, we continue to repeat on this program um, uh, over and over uh, again that we're watching Guyana moving steadfastly in the direction of an authoritarian state because more and more the executive of this country, the Apno AFC government, is putting their tentacles into every facet of life, every facet of life. The executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the economy. In fact, this government is, is sucking up even the credit that exists in this country. They are, they are sucking up more out there, overcrowding the private sector by by the amount of credit they're accessing and using so that this is not bode well for Ghana and that's a subject for another uh, program what's going on in the economy because we keep going back to the economy and what's happening but <coughs> you have a blessed week and remember don't drink and drive please don't drink and drive so many of our young people are injured and lose their lives so many people not just young people and then we have also speeding you know, every day I'm on the road, I, I am terrified by some of the things I see. People really take chances in this country, and we are a rather discourteous group of drivers, really. Uh, we don't respect each other. And so it's important that drive safely, don't drink and drive, don't speed. We want everybody to vote 2018 and 2020 for the BBC. But I want you to be safe in the first place for your loved ones. And so, as usual, we close and we'll meet each other next Thursday at 12.30. Have a blessed week until we meet again right here on matters of public importance. And so, and struggle we shall. And silent we shall not be. I keep reminding you, silence, silence is our enemy. It's the greatest enemy to, econ to the democracy. Silence makes those who are in power think they can get away with anything. Silence helps those who want more control and less democracy, those who want to move this country to a police state. And in the next elections, the people will make their votes count again. And there will be a new government. And it will be a PPPC government. And we will have to start all over again, as in 1992, to reconstruct, to put this economy back on its feet, on a firm and stable footing, restore the programs which help the poor and the vulnerable and those at risk. And, and restore the independence of the judiciary and legislature from executive interference. Keep strong. Keep strong. There will, 2020, we will be back. And if things really get bad, who knows? Maybe before. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Stay strong. Bye bye.